Hi, my name is Sebastian Matteau and today I would like to talk to you about async await and async IO in Python. Now, what is this all about? Well, let's first talk a little bit about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous code, which is not all that complicated. Uh, synchronous code is just the kind of code that you're probably used to, right? It's the kind of code that runs one function after another. So each time that a function is called, we wait until it's finished and then we call the next function, etc. That is synchronous code. Asynchronous code is code that runs multiple functions seemingly in parallel. Now, why seemingly? Well, because we are not making use of processes, right? We're not making use of multiple processes actually running in the operating system. We're also not making use of threads, right? Which are sort of sub-processes that run within a single process. Rather, everything is happening within one thread and one process, but we just very rapidly alternate the functions. Functions suspend and then another function takes over, then that function suspends, another function resumes, etc, etc. And this gives, a, gives the appearance of running things in parallel without any kind of the, the, the resources and complications that you have with threading and multiprocessing. Now, in order to run asynchronous code, you need to write code that is explicitly designed to be asynchronous. So you need to write well-behaved functions. And specifically, these functions need to occasionally explicitly resume in order to give other functions the opportunity to take over and uh, run themselves, right? So it is kind of cooperative um, multiprocessing style, you could say. Now, also very important, in asynchronous programming, you should never use blocking functions. For example, time.sleep is a blocking function, which just pauses the execution of your program until uh, the sleeping time is over. And that will completely break the asynchrony because it will mean that every function has to wait until the time.sleep is finished. And the same is true for things like uh, doing network communication with the socket uh, module, etc. Instead, you need to use uh, functions that have been designed specifically for asynchronous, uh, asynchronous programming. And the uh, async IO module provides a lot of those functions. For example, async IO has a sleep function that is an alternative to the time.sleep function. So it's an asynchronous alternative, and we will see that here. Now, quick note on Python versions. So the async and the await keywords, which I will use in this uh, tutorial, were introduced in Python 3.5. Um, but the async IO module was introduced a little bit before in Python 3.4. And essentially everything that you can do with await and async can be done with a little bit of a different syntax using the async IO module. But uh, with Python 3.3 or earlier versions, you cannot do this at all. You can approximate some of the techniques using generated coroutines, which I won't talk about. But essentially before Python 3.4, you could not do this kind of asynchronous programming. Now, let's get to work. Uh, what are we going to do? As a, as a sort of a, a dummy code, I would like to use uh, uh, a function that determines the highest prime number below a certain value. And we're going to do that three times for three different values. So we'll create a main function, main, right? That's going to be the entry point to our program. And I'm going to assume that there is a highest prime below function, below, and first we're going to do this for 100,000. And then we're going to highest prime below for 10,000. And finally, we're going to do this for the highest prime below for 1,000. And then we call our main function here. Right now, of course, I still need to define this highest prime below function. So def highest prime below. Nothing special here, huh? This is just completely synchronous ordinary code. How does that work? Well, let's first print out the debugging message because then we can see, we can kind of follow the flow of our, uh, of our code when we execute it. So I'll print out uh, highest prime below up the x. And then what we're going to do is for y in range x minus one until, uh, until zero with steps of minus one. So we're going to, i is going to decrement from x minus one down to, uh, down to uh, one. And then we're going to say, if is prime uh, y, print out that we found it, right? So we print out, okay, the uh, highest prime below uh, dip is dip, x comma y, and we're going to return y. And then what I'm going to do to kind of simulate that this is a, to kind of simulate a problem with blocking uh, blocking functions, I'm going to do a time.sleep of 
0.01, so sleep for 10 milliseconds. The import time module, right? So this could be, this is kind of an, uh, an uh, obviously it's, it's, it's useless here, but it kind of demonstrates what happens when you have uh, blocking functions such as time.sleep, but also network communication in your code. Um, now, if we don't find any uh, prime number, we simply return none. Then we still need to have a function that determines whether something is a prime number. That's a little bit of interesting uh, problem. How can you do that? Well, you can do it in many ways and probably I have no idea how to do it most efficiently. But what you can do, for example, is return. If it's not the case that for any uh, x uh, divided by integer divided by i equals x float divided by i. In other words, if the integer division of x by y, i, sorry, is the same as the float division. In other words, if x is, if is uh, divisible by, by, uh, by i, then it is not, then it's obviously not a prime number, right? Because x should not be divisible by i if it's prime. And then for i in range uh, x minus one to uh, one, uh, one in steps of minus one. Okay, so that is a way to determine if x is a prime number, right? It doesn't really matter if you cannot flow to, follow the logic here, although it's a nice exercise. So we, we decrement i from x minus one down to uh, two, and then we check if x is divisible by i. And if it's, that's not the case for any i, then it's prime. That's the logic here. Now let's see if this works. So I'll just run it. Up. Yes, this works. And you see the synchronicity of our code, right? Because we first call highest prime below 100,000, up. It returns, does its calculation, it returns, then we do it for 10,000, returns, we do it for 1,000, it returns, etc. So this is purely synchronous. Now let's gradually make this code asynchronous, right? Asynchrony is not an all or nothing thing. We can kind of gradually make it asynchronous. Although code that is partly asynchronous and partly synchronous can be a little bit inelegant, right? It's not an ideal situation, but it's possible. So as a first step towards asynchrony, we simply say that main is an async def. It's an asynchronous function. If I now run it up, you see that it doesn't crash. It's still valid Python, but main doesn't do anything. Rather, it's a coroutine object. Why is that? Well, that's because asynchronous functions are not intended to be called like that. They have to be either awaited, and we will see that later, or they, will have to, or they have to be passed to the event loop. And the event loop is a uh, well, program, uh, software, that uh, takes care of all the asynchrony, right? That manages which functions execute when, etc. Now, where is this event loop? It's in the async IO library. Uh, and then we, where, so where is it? Well, the event loop is in async IO dot get event loop and then we say loop dot run until complete main right so it's pretty simple we get the event loop and then we run this function in the event loop until it's complete easy peasy normally you would say loop dot close when you're done uh, I'm go not going to do that here because if I do that in this interactive IPython terminal it will uh, break things but normally you would do that if you would do it in the script now Let's run it. Uh, so this runs again, but you see it still behaves exactly in the same way as our synchronous code does, right? Because we call our highest prime below with the 100,000, then with 10,000, and then with 1,000. Now, and we have not explicitly, we have not designed our function to be well behaved, right? We have not uh, made any real changes that, that improve the timing, uh, that, that, that allow our code to become asynchronous. So what can we do? Well. We can say, okay, uh, we also make highest prime below uh, asynchronous. So we say, okay, this is asynchronous. If I now run it, I will get a warning. Up, a runtime warning, coroutine, highest prime below was never awaited. That's because here I'm, I'm kind of trying to call this asynchronous function, but that's not the way to do it, right? You either have to pass it to the event loop, which we've already done, or you have to await it. So I say, await, await. Oh wait, now if I now run it, it still, it still works, uh, but it still does exactly what it did before. It's still not truly asynchronous. Why not? Well, because we've not given our program any explicit points at which to, uh, to basically suspend the function and have another function take it over. 
right? We simply await this until it's finished, then we await this until it's finished, and then we await this until it's finished. But that is not asynchronous, right? It is some, it has some asynchronous syntax in it, but it is not uh, in terms of, it's not logically asynchronous. So what can we do? How do we actually make this asynchronous? Well, we can, the first step is by, instead of awaiting each of these functions in turn, synchronously, we can say, okay, I await, not these functions, but async.io.wait, and this function async.io.wait takes a series of, takes a series of coroutines, So a list of coroutines, right? A list of asynchronous function calls, and it executes them. And it waits until they're all done. Now, if I execute this, up, it will work. And this is already slightly asynchronous in the sense that we have lost control over which function is called first, right? You see, in this case, now the highest prime below thousand is called first, and then 10,000 and then 100,000. And if I call it again, it will use a different order. So there's an element of randomness in here, which is inherent to asynchronous programming. So we have, we have some asynchrony, but it's still, still not really, really asynchronous because each function is executed. Then we wait until it completes. Then we call the next and then we wait until it completes. And then we call the next and wait until it completes. So how can we make this really asynchronous? Well, the trick, the magic trick to making a function really asynchronous is to adding somewhere in the, in the function, a point where you say, okay, now I'm going to suspend. And this can be here. If we say, instead of time.sleep, we say await async.io.sleep 0.01. Then we tell our event loop or we tell our function, okay, now suspend, hand over the, the handover processing time to the event loop. And the event loop will then activate another function that will run for a little while, it will suspend, another function will resume, run for a little while, will suspend, etc., etc. Right, so here, by, by adding this await async io.sleep function, we have made our code uh, well behaved. We have made it truly asynchronous. Now look at what happens to the, here, if I run it, you will see, up, now we launch all three functions, but instead of waiting for each function to complete, before the calling the next function, you see they all complete more or less this at the same time. And that is that is asynchrony in action, right? So we launch all functions, then we eat all the functions while they're running, they suspend here with this await statement, giving the other function calls a chance to resume and do their work, etc. So they all start working seemingly in parallel, but really in very rapid alternation until they're all done more or less at the same time. And they all print out their result to the, to the debug window. Right, so this is this is truly asynchronous code. Now, um, and then you will see, right, just to show you the difference, if I activate time.sleep, you will see it will become synchronous again because it is really this point where we allow the function to suspend that, in, that implements the asynchronous aspect of our code. Now, another thing that is can be relevant in some cases is uh, execution speed. So let's time this. Say, okay, t0, right, is time dot time. So I get, a, I, I take a timestamp from before we calculate all the highest primes, a timestamp for afterwards, time dot time, and I say print up, this took 2f milliseconds. Now, so I need to multiply by a thousand, right, because uh, time dot time returns seconds, not milliseconds. And then I say t1 minus t0. Okay, up. if I run this, you will say, okay, took 584 milliseconds. Uh, to see how stable this is, do it again, up, 591, right? So let's say slightly less than 600 milliseconds. Now, if I remove this asynchronous aspect, so I, I comment out the await async.io.sleep and introduce the regular sleep, both of which are sleep functions that sleep for 10 milliseconds, and if I run it, you will see now it takes 695, right? If I run it again, uh, even 740. So about 100, maybe 150 milliseconds slower than our asynchronous implementation. Now, why is that? Well, that is simply because this async io.sleep is not blocking. Rather, what it does is simply say, okay, suspend the function, allow the other functions to run, and about 10 milliseconds later, take back control and resume. Right? So the 10 milliseconds uh, sleep that is spent sleeping is not spent for the computer just completely being idle, 
Rather, it is spent with the other functions doing their calculations. And so you have a little performance gain. Now here, the performance gain is very small, but if you're working with socket, com right, with network communications, with sockets, where for example, sometimes you have to wait a long time until a server responds, for example, um, then you can get really massive performance improvements here. Now, okay, I hope I've been able to explain how async uh, await and async IO work in a nutshell. They are not that difficult. Asynchronous functions are simply functions that alternate that, that are execute, executed in very rapid alternation in a way that makes them look parallel, but it's really in the same process and without any threading. Um, and if you want to write asynchronous code, you need to make sure that your code is well behaved so that it awaits functions, for example, using await async io.sleep so that other functions can take over. And you should avoid blocking functions because they will cause enormous performance hits. Now, thank you very much for your attention.